Okay, so today we're going to perform the dehydration of 2-methyl-2-butanol to give 2-methyl-2-butene. To do that, we're going to have to distill the product from the starting material. So, we're going to set up a distillation. You may already be familiar with setting up a distillation apparatus, however it is imperative that it is done correctly, since the product is highly flammable and very volatile. So if it is not done correctly, the apparatus may catch fire. The reaction mixture has been cooled in ice to ensure that it does not start reacting prematurely. So the first thing we're going to do is make sure that it is securely held by the retort stand. Affix the clamp around the neck of the flask, ensuring that it is secure, and then lower it into position. Notice that I always clamp the piece of glassware first and then adjust the boss head. First adjusting the distance that the clamp is held from the retort stand, and then finally adjusting the height at which it is held. By following this order, you will always have the item correctly clamped in the position that you want it in and it won't move around as you start to close the other clamps. Next I put in the still head. Following the still head, I put in the Liebig condenser. You'll notice now that the Liebig condenser will need to be supported by another clamp. So again we follow the same procedure. Loosen all three screws, securely clamp your piece of glassware, and then adjust the distance and the height of the piece of glassware so that it is held securely in the correct position. It is important to make sure that the glassware is not straining against the stand or that the two stands aren't straining against each other because if this happens your glassware joints will be inclined to work themselves apart as the distillation goes on. This is not a desirable situation since then the gas will be able to escape through the joints lowering your yield and presenting a hazard since the gas may be toxic and in this case it is most definitely flammable. You can see from both angles that I make very sure that the glass joints between the still head and the condenser and the still head and the round bottom flask are securely joined. You may or may not use grease on these joints, however if you do be careful that it doesn't contaminate the product since this would render our distillation pointless. We then put on the distillation adapter. Notice the small vent on the top of this adapter. It is very important that this remain open since heating a closed system is a dangerous thing to do. Next we add on our round bottom flask and then we're nearly ready. Attach the water lines the water goes in the bottom of the condenser and out the top of the condenser. This is with respect to gravity, so that the water always flows in from the bottom and out the top. Even if the water stops flowing, the condenser will remain full of water, and so at least provide some cooling. It's important when you turn this on then, that you turn on the tap slowly. If the water is going too quickly, it is likely that the rubber tubing will pop off. There's also no point in wasting water, but we'll come back to that. The last part in this puzzle is to put in the thermometer. It's important when you put in the thermometer that you put it in at just the right position. What we're trying to measure is the gas temperature of the gas that is making it into the condenser. So we position our thermometer so that the bulb is just in line with where the gas that is entering the condenser is passing by. Then we turn our water on. Notice here the relatively low flow. And then once we've got the flow adjusted so that it's at just a trickle, we can then turn on the heat. One last check before we turn the heat on then. The water is flowing, although not too fast. All the joints are secure and the retort stands aren't putting any pressure on the glassware, just holding it in place. We then turn the temperature up. It's very important to notice that the switch on the side, the one that I point out there, is set to 1. By setting it to 1, it heats up the lower portion of the heating mantle. If we set it to 2, it heats the upper portion. However, the upper portion is not in contact with our round bottom flask and so will not be effective in heating our round bottom flask. After some time, the mixture will begin to boil and the gas will make it over into the Liebig condenser. Once the first drop comes across, we want to measure the temperature. This is the temperature that our liquid is distilling across at. Don't forget your measurement rules when you're measuring the temperature. Distillation will then take place over the next 10 to 20 minutes. How long it takes depends on a whole range of factors. However, you should not attempt to rush it by turning the temperature up too high, as this will be detrimental to the effectiveness of your distillation. You can, of course, use this time to calculate the yield from your reaction. Once we're satisfied that we have a reasonable amount of product distilled over, we can then turn down the heat. It is, of course, going to take a while for this whole thing to cool down. And while we're waiting for it to cool down, the product will continue to distill across. So you can, of course, turn the heat off in advance of when you expect the reaction to end. Once we've turned the heat off, then we can just wait for the distillation to finish. And once the distillation is finished, then we're going to increase the rate at which our thing cools. So we'll see now, if we speed up the time on this, we can see a considerable amount of liquid distills over after I've turned the heat off. 
Okay, so now we're going to lift our round bottom flask up slightly out of the heating mantle and this will allow it to cool at a greater rate. To do that, we loosen both of the boss heads on the retort stands and we raise it up by maybe one or two inches. You've got to take care when you're doing this. It's important that the joints stay connected. You still don't want any remaining flammable va vapors leaking out onto the hot heating mantle. But with a little care and attention, it's possible to do this quite safely. So just make sure that once you've tightened all of the boss heads up afterwards, that there is no remaining pressure pulling the glassware apart. Then we'll switch out our round bottom flask and put in another round bottom flask to catch any remaining liquid that's going to distill over because it's not worth waiting for every final drop and we'll take away our product for testing. Before we do any tests on our product or work any more work on our product, let's look at what we've made. What have we done? We've taken an alcohol and we've turned it into an alkene. We know there are several important differences between alcohols and alkenes. Alcohols are polar, alkenes are nonpolar. Alcohols, or our alcohol in this case, is saturated and our alkene will be unsaturated. You may want to pause at this point and have a closer look at that mechanism, but for now we're going to continue on. You'll notice if you take a close look at your product that there is water in the flask as well. This is an inevitable consequence of the distillation. We can get rid of this water by adding in a drying agent. The drying agent we're going to use is sodium carbonate. So we're going to transfer our product into a conical flask and then add some sodium carbonate. A general guide for how much sodium carbonate to add at this point would be the tip of a spatula full. You don't have to add an exact amount of sodium carbonate because it's only serving a physical purpose to remove the water from our product. If you add in much too much sodium carbonate, some of your product will stick to it and you'll reduce the yield. If you don't add in enough, you won't absorb all the water. But it will be clear when you look at it whether or not there is still water floating around. It is very important to put the lid back on the bottle of sodium carbonate since it is anhydrous and it will pull water out of the atmosphere, thus lessening its utility as a drying agent. Here we can see the sodium carbonate has mopped up much of the water and then we can decant or pour carefully and leave the solid behind, getting our product back into a clean weighed round bottom flask. If we know the weight of the round bottom flask, we can then measure the weight of our product by weighing the weight of the product and the round bottom flask combined. So decant it very carefully, pour it off very slowly. It's a very thin liquid and it'll easily leave the solid behind as long as you're a little bit careful. And now we have our product. And the last thing we're going to do then is going to do some tests. If we look carefully, we can see that it's nice and clear and no longer cloudy and no longer has any drops of water. So we're going to do a quick test for saturation. In the left hand test tube, I have bromine in chloroform. In the middle, I have a starting material and on the right, I have our product. If I add bromine and chloroform to our starting material, I can see that the bromine does not react. However, if I add bromine to our product, observe now and see what happens. You can see that the bromine reacts almost instantaneously, decolorizing the solution as it's added. This is because the unsaturated double bonds are reacting rapidly with the bromine to create a dib dibromal product. You can investigate the mechanism of this before coming to the lab. You're also going to measure the refractive index of your product to show that it is the material that you think it is. But you've already learned to use a refractometer. If you want to refresh on that video, the link is up to the right so you can rewatch it. That's all for now. I hope the video has been helpful. If you have any questions, post a comment below, post a comment on Moodle, or ask in the lab. That's all. Bye.